Hello, maybe we should make a start. Thank you everybody for your attention. So, who wants to make open source software better? Yes? Yes? Say yes if we want to make open source software better. Yes, we want to make it better. Yes? Yes, we do, right? And that's what product management is about. That's what product management is all about. We're about managing products better to serve users' needs better. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you about now. And I'd like to ask, I've already asked a few of you individually, but I'd like to ask you as a group, do we have any professional product managers in the audience? We have a director of product here. One at the back, thank you. Two, don't be shy. Any more? Anybody who has been a product manager of any kind of product? Excellent. Three more. So we have five. And I know that we have some people who are completely unfamiliar with product management as well in the audience. So I'm going to try and bridge this chasm and introduce you to some principles and get on to quite quickly the challenges and opportunities that are unique to product management in open source. So first off, uh, for some of you, I might need to justify the need for product management before we get into the details because we can expect a lot from hackers. Uh, on their own, uh, in situations much like this. Uh, they produce wonderful things without any managers, right? Uh, great uh, ideas, products, uh, even some one or two billion dollar open source companies have come out of uh, hackathons and hacker situations much like this without any management at all initially. So maybe we need to justify the need for management before we go further. First off, I would say creating value is difficult. Very difficult, in fact. And that's partly because complexity grows and grows as we use more libraries and we deploy to more systems and we want to deploy more quickly and we want to be able to do more, more reliably, and we want to automate more. Complexity increases and that helps to have a manager overseeing things so that we meet expectations. And also creating value is hard because when you build something, it doesn't mean people will come. Like these ghost cities in China circa 2009, 2010, made to, to be occupied by hundreds of thousands of people uh, without a market because of the financial crash that happened before. If you build it, they will not necessarily come. And it's expensive to build things when people don't come and use them, and also quite disappointing for one's ego and one's team and one's supporters. So it's nice to build something that people actually want to use. And management helps with that too. But even when you meet people's demands and you create value up front, initially you get it right once, you get a nice launch and a splash and things are going swimmingly, well, things can change quite quickly because people's expectations shift depending on what other options they have. And just because your spider web was the most attractive option for flies to commit suicide yesterday doesn't mean that some bastard won't invent flypaper tomorrow and you'll lose all your users. So you need to stay focused on what people want in order to stay competitive. Because if you don't stay competitive, then you don't have any users. Additionally, assumptions are inherent to our thinking as human beings. And maybe some of you are familiar with this cartoon. It's very difficult to shift our perspectives on a habitual basis to perceive what others do from the same source input. And actually that is something that requires skill and experience, both uh, training and, and experience to avoid those assumptions because as many of you will know, assumptions make an ass out of you and me. And there's all kinds of assumptions built into products. I'm currently designing a new product myself right now and the number of assumptions I'm making is quite terrifying. So we need a lot of work to avoid these assumptions and having managers who are experienced at teasing out the hypotheses hidden in the software that we're designing and the way that we're deploying and the messaging that we're using, that is a really critical skill. And it's a skill among many other skills that having a technical background doesn't necessarily prepare you for very well. Many of us in this room, I suspect, will have spent the bulk of your careers on improving your technical skills, becoming technical leaders. And in that time that you were spending getting to be a perfectly clean coder and improving your standards and expectations, automating everything, you may have neglected to be developing some of your other skills like user research or compliance. That's super exciting, right? Culture building, important in both 
uh, open source community projects and, com and company run projects. Fundraising, uh, either from investors or from grants, depending on uh, where you're seeking your backing. These are things which, having a long and successful history as a software engineer, it doesn't prepare you for, actually. And as an engineer, these other skills, they can feel like a series of traps that you walk into one after another, like, nobody told me I had to be great at human resources just in order to keep my voluntary team together. Well, yeah, you kind of do, right? Understanding people's needs and predicting them and making sure people feel comfortable and avoiding harassment and all sorts of other issues, they don't come necessarily naturally to people who've got technical skills. Doesn't equal project success. Finally, some of you may be smugly thinking, well, actually, you know, Sam, I do have all those skills. I've learned my lessons. I've been doing it all this time. And congratulations to you, because that's a hell of an achievement. If that's your situation, you still might have trouble convincing others to recognize those skills, particularly others who have a lot of money, which you might need to either kick off your next project or make it sustainable or buy into it as your first users or customers or back you as a government agency if you want funding support from something like Prototype Fund or others. So having people who have successfully proved they can build products as product managers can be very useful for convincing people with resources to back you, even if you know you already have all of those skills inside you. If we want to build world-class products which are open source, then there is an argument that we should adopt some methodology from those global companies which are teaching our children and our friends what it means to be a world-class application today. And those companies all use product managers. I was talking to one of our audience members from Elastic, and they have lots of product managers. Many big companies have many, many product managers, and some of them are rock stars. Sometimes product managers are called CEO of product. Sometimes they have an ego to match. Sometimes they have a reputation to match. But they have a huge influence over what the product becomes and how well it suits their needs. So for all these reasons, product management, I think, is important to open source. Before we go any further, it's worth converging on a definition of a product. Let's do this quite Quickly, a good or a service that most closely meets the requirements of a particular market, a particular market, and yields enough profit to justify its continued existence. I think this is a good definition of a product. If we adapt it to a community-based product, then we could reword it as a good or service that closely meets the requirements of a particular user group and yields enough resources to justify its continued existence. What's important about this is that products are for specific groups of people. They're not just for everybody. And they need to be sustained one way or another because they consume resources. And it's not primarily for you as the person who makes the product. We're not just making something for ourselves. We're making something for other people and probably an awful lot of people because the nature of software is that it's expensive to make and it scales very well. So we want to ideally target a lot of people with something specifically for them, and then we have a product. But that's product in general. What about a product in software more specifically? Well, we can lean on a, a sage of the past, Mr. Fred Brooks, who wrote an excellent book in 1975 called The Mythical Man Month, who defined a software product as going through four stages with a three times multiple between transition of each of these stages. So often open source starts out as a program, which we have here top left. That's something that works for me. It works on my laptop. You might think of it as being a prototype or a proof of concept, for example. And many people look at this and they think, this is a product, this is complete, this is ready. I'm so happy with this thing, it scratches my itch, I'm going to launch it to the world. But actually, they're a factor of nine away from what other people would consider a product, which is something which is not only a proof of concept that works on that environment, for that person, for that person's need, but actually has interfaces to other systems, is integrated with other necessary systems, is tested, is generalized so it works in other environments, is documented, and is maintained because a hidden expectation of just about every user of every piece of software ever is that it will continue to be improved and maintained in future, which is something that crowdfunding campaigns often forget when they raise enough money to do one thing and then don't realize they've just raised the expectations of 20,000 people that there's going to be a lifetime of free updates following. And all of this makes making a product hard. Punct. Anybody not think making a product is hard? Good, then you'll be interested in why it's especially hard to make open source products. 
Um, making value is our goal rather than making features. Um, and this can be a culture clash when we are looking at open source communities because when we check on GitHub uh, what the health of our favorite open source application is, we will be looking at when the last release is and maybe we might check the release notes and see how many things were in that. And that's all about measuring output rather than measuring outcome. And yes, it is one way of measuring the health of a, of a project or a product, but it's not an indicator that it's going to meet your needs or be delivering value for you or other people. So this is one of the first challenges that we have. The term value isn't widely used around community-based open source products. They have other terms which are valuable in other ways, but I'm gonna be talking a lot about value. I think this is a very helpful way in to what we're going to be discussing. And the ways that product managers typically pursue value with their uh, activities are these. User research, user story mapping, prototyping of products, sprint management or the development cycle management, acceptance testing, and metrics monitoring. And these are all to do with what we call a virtuous feedback loop of interviewing, testing, reporting back data, and improving, which we'll come back to in just a few minutes. Now, before I get into more details about the different kinds of open source product management, we need to recognize that different organizations are on a continuum. Some people may object to me putting Android and Docker on the left, but everybody in the room is probably on this scale. I'd like to ask how many of the projects represented here today are purely company managed, where the community has no direct control over releases or priorities? Show of hands, please. Everybody has community input, okay. So who's at the other end? Purely community projects, where companies, they don't have to worry about, they don't have to worry about commercial entities telling them what to do. Two, only two, okay. What, what projects are you guys from? And Doc? Very nice, Apache is a beautiful example of that. And so does that mean everybody else is a hybrid or do we have some people not working in open source? Sorry? Okay, very good, exactly. Gnome's a beautiful example. And depending on where you are on this spectrum, different levels of challenge and opportunity arise when it comes to product management. Because if you're basically operating like a regular company that dumps its source code, then you don't really have to worry too much about the stakeholders because you're probably going to be not paying that close attention to what they need. If you're on the community end, then you work completely differently from that. You can't take the traditional autocratic approach and do whatever you, you know, make decisions that purely serve your commercial ends. Right. So our first challenge in open source when it comes to product management, which our proprietary alternatives do not face, is that we have more stakeholders, right? We have a lot more stakeholders. Often we have the same number of stakeholders as typical proprietary software products, but in addition to that, we obviously have a community. And the kind of representatives that we have in that community vary depending on where we are in that spectrum, but there's a good chance it will include all these people. It may even include governance, I know that we have LibreOffice here today, for example. They have built into the legal structure of the organization a membership committee and a technical steering committee. And those are additional stakeholders which most product managers have never even literally dreamed of, right? And thinking about uh, having to communicate with and keep on board a group of other organizations who are third party on a technical steering committee, well, that's another level that um, will shock other community, uh, other product managers. But you might also have a business community uh, around your open source product too, which bring all their own needs and expectations. You might have independent service providers, people who are building products and companies around the value that you're creating, and maybe you care about them and maybe you don't, but they have expectations. Maybe you have downstream integrators who are taking your product and including it in another thing, packaging it differently, or maybe you have downstream forks, like SAP, who has internal forks of all kinds of open source applications, including TensorFlow, and everything Thing that happens upstream affects them and they're likely to tell you about it if you do something which causes them with problems. These are stakeholders which basically result in you having fewer decision-making options, fewer, uh, less latitude, you could say, to make uh, top-down decisions, which of course is a good thing because they're feeding you information at the same time. 
but it makes it a lot more difficult. Because in addition to all those other skills that product managers are expected to have, the emotional intelligence to keep people happy at all these different levels, you also have these stakeholders who will put additional pressure on you, quite possibly publicly, if you make a decision which affects them in a way that you didn't anticipate. In addition to the stakeholders, we also have transparency. We have an, a, a whole nother level of transparency to deal with in open source. Primarily prioritization is, um, whether it's formal or informal, we need to communicate as product managers what use case we're prioritizing, what features, um, what timelines, and sometimes we need, if we're working for a company, to prioritize things which are unpopular with the open source community. And we might need to justify and explain ourselves in a way that if we were working in a closed source company, again, we would never have to think about. So informal prioritization would be when we just give more thought, more time, and more energy to pull requests from certain representatives or from in, in relating to certain uh, functionality. Uh, whereas formal would be when we're saying, for example, we're not going to really dru release Drupal 8 until this feature set is ready because that's a really important set of features for this release and for the people that we're trying to impress as an organization. We have to be transparent about that. We also have to be very transparent about authority and expectations because there is always authority and there are always expectations. When they're not clearly defined, they're still there. They're just ambiguous and causing more confusion. So governance is one great way uh, of clarifying these things in official documents, but it's amazing how users' expectations can run riot when you don't keep them in check. Um, and we need to be explicit to avoid upsetting users uh, with unrealistic expectations or expectations that don't match with, with what we have. We have multi-dimensional quality, so we're not just gauged our success, the success of the products we make is not solely based on how efficiently that product solves the problems it's designed to solve, but it also incorporates some of these other things we've just mentioned. So if we have good governance in an open source project, that's considered by many to be one of the aspects of the quality of the product, which again is not something you'd have to think about if you're just producing a proprietary application. Um, yeah number of different aspects of, of quality which others don't have to consider. And again, we can expect a public debate when we fall short on people's expectations of the quality of the product. Uh, of course, security uh, is imperative for everybody, but in open source, as many of you will be familiar, it produces a, a particular set of pressures and questions. With a new application, obviously, there's likely to be as many people trying to break the code as use it, and we just have less breathing space. Yes, it's a good thing we can't lie. It's a good thing that we can't misrepresent the hashing and the algorithms that we're using. But at the same time, it puts enormous pressure, especially on small projects who may not have the resources to respond very quickly. Um, it's a unique challenge for us. And all these things add up to us needing additional leadership discipline in the management, product management field than our counterparts often would in the proprietary side. Because what we do is being seen. What we are, uh, the decisions that we're making require us to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. We don't have coercive authority or other forms of management authority to lean back on and to rely on. We've got a bunch of community members and contributors who can take their effort elsewhere and don't rely on us for their paycheck. So we really have to practice what we preach, which is a challenge. Finally, we have less data in order to make these product management decisions that we want to. Earlier, we saw the uh, feedback loop uh, here, somewhere in my slides, which I've lost. But a critical component is data for making the good decisions that we need to as product managers. We can't come through this virtuous iterative cycle successfully if we're not measuring the impact of the decisions that we're making and the improvements that we're applying. So um, validated learning becomes more challenging and that's partly because our users have a double standard for open source products versus the proprietary products that they're using when it comes to privacy. Again, of course, we should expect privacy and many people like and support open source products specifically because they have more faith in it because the code is public. But that makes measuring the success of what we're doing extremely difficult, extremely difficult. If you go to any startup conference and listen to a talk about product management, they will be talking about all kinds of data, data galore. You can get it for free. 
there's free startup plans for all these analytics platforms, all these you know, conversion automation platforms that we don't have access to and we should not. Our users expect very different things from us when it comes to the telemetry that we collect and the amount of information that we build up on them, the profiles that we have. They also don't necessarily expect us to grab them for an interview in a, a, a Jitsi call or a WhatsApp call to talk about their needs. But that's quite normal with product management in the private or uh, the proprietary sector. If we do include measurements, then they may be removed. If we do include measurements, then we may damage our brand. I'm reminded of GitLab a few months ago, which uh, slipped a terms of service update into our mailboxes for the self-hosted users, which seemed all very boring until people realized that it meant they were embedding a third-party analytics platform within the self-hosted version of GitLab, which prompted a crisis, backpedaling, and a public apology from the CEO, and also months of work being reversed and the roadmap for the product being changed. These things have consequences. We wouldn't think twice if we were a proprietary company about including that because first of all, our users may not know, and second of all, they probably just wouldn't hold us to the same standard. All of that means that we have less insight into the user experience of people with our product. We don't know what they're enjoying. We don't know what they're hating. They may give us feedback via GitHub issues, but that's different from actually knowing how they use it because what people say and what people do are very different things. People don't necessarily have insight into what their pain point is or into why they stopped using a product or what they felt uneasy about or why it wasn't as competitive as another product. That kind of information is especially taken from monitoring what people do and seeing what they do in real time. And again, if we don't have that, then we can't make those decisions. And that makes it hard for us to identify the value of the products that we're making. And if we can't identify the value of the products that we're making, like for example, using Miele washing machines in rural China to wash potatoes instead of clothes, if we can't know what people are doing with our products that is different from what we expected, then we can't improve the experience further for those users and we can't capture the value of those users. We can't capture any of the value of that experience, which is important for making our product sustainable and resourcing ourselves to be competitive. We also have very few open source tools in this field, like A-B testing tools, analytics tools, telemetry tools. Uh, that's one of the weakest areas, in my experience, for open source options versus using proprietary ones. And if it's not open source, then there's a good chance we won't be able to self-host. And that means not only would we be using proprietary analytics tools, but we'd also be sending our users analytics data to the United States to come back to us, which is doubly problematic. We also may have culture clash, right? So many open source products are founded by a single charismatic technical leader and technical excellence may be the basis of a product, but it is not a recipe for success for long-term product development. Technical leadership can maintain a focus on output, again, rather than on value and it may mean that we end up with other companies or even potentially community projects which take the code that we're making as an open source uh, community oriented projects and do not have the same restrictions or the same pressures from their community because they don't have one. So they take what we make, use traditional closed decision making practices and capture the value that we are not as uh, the open source upstream project, which is particularly challenging. And it also means that focus and coherence can be very difficult when we have a culture that's focused on releases because we need ultimately a coherent set of features that work together to achieve certain tasks that solve particular user needs. And when we have people making suggestions and requests and submitting code and patches, from all, all over the uh, ecosystem, from all sorts of different use cases, it makes it difficult to have a product which is unified with a, 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 um, an interface which is well tailored to one specific group and one specific set of challenges. Focus and coherence becomes very difficult when you're trying to meet the needs of everybody because everybody has an opinion as kind of contributing. However, having gone through all those challenges, I can say all of which I've personally felt in different organizations and different kinds of products in the past, there are advantages that we need to recognize and take advantage of. So first off, many open source projects start out by dog fooding, scratching the itch. It's the classic, right? Eric S. Raymond, etc. Well, if you're scratching your own itch, then you are scratching an itch. It might not be 
everybody's itch, but at least one itch is being scratched. And that's what we often call dog fooding, which is when you eat your own dog food and you test your own product, and that helps get you off the ground and stay focused on solving at least one problem. Our large and diverse user base means we get large and diverse input, which is the flip side of some of the challenges I was mentioning earlier. That means we get reports from outer space effectively, running in operating systems and environments and hardware and use cases which we may never have dreamed of. All kinds of people seek out open source as their first choice, which otherwise you wouldn't necessarily have heard of in different languages and regions and contexts, which is wonderful. In the past, I've had security reports from universities who I had no idea that were using us. They're open source and they come out of the woodwork and it's great. We have more eager testers, typically. People who may produce high quality reports. They're more expert in their field. And if we're lucky, we get even patches. Although I wouldn't hold your breath unless the product is aimed at technical users. As somebody who's made marketing products in the past that are open source, we had very little patches, I must say. Additionally, we get a lot of feedback. It is self-selected feedback, which can be a challenge because it doesn't necessarily represent your user base. But it's thick and fast, and you can expect it to continue, which is great. It's cheap to sit there and wait for people to test your product and use it and tell you how it went, rather than having to go out or pay for research. We can't avoid having cutting-edge ideas because we have a very technical community of open source developers, typically. And like it or not, they will pull you into the 21st century and make suggestions about how to release it better and manage it better and automate things better, which is wonderful. We also are forced into best practice. We have here chefs working in a glass kitchen, and that's how it feels, right? If our product management, if our prioritization, if our decision making, if our governance is all in the public sphere, then we have no choice but to basically be at the cutting edge, because otherwise people will point out that we're not. Um, if we don't take into account ethics in our licensing and workplace practices, people will see it more clearly because people tend to be more vocal around our projects. We may even get fairer governance if we are lucky and we put effort into it, but we can certainly expect to be held to a very high standard when it comes to data management and privacy, and that's great. we held to a high standard. It makes us better as individual product managers and it makes our products better. Um, yeah. Forkability, yeah, that's just what I put in. So one of the upsides is if you don't like how your senior management is treating you, then theoretically you can take the source code and run it in a di different direction. Cough next cloud, cough. Uh, so when we look back at the typical activities of what product managers uh, are typically doing uh, in any kind of organization, these aspects of user research, prototyping, etc., then we do have open source tools to help us with this, and some of them are pretty good. So for the user research side, um, I've used OBS Studio for doing recorded interviews. You can also use multiple cameras there. It's very nice. See what the user's doing with your product. Um, I know that uh, we have usability experts in the room who've used similar approaches with improving Thunderbird usability and others. Uh, PHP List is nice for sending out a lot of emails with uh, uh, invitations to give feedback and surveys, for example, uh, customized to different languages, etc. For user story mapping, I got to recommend Post-its. Technically, I don't know, it's maybe debatable if it's open source, but paper is actually better for some things. But we also have a nice app called Twinery. There's a bunch of other apps here. I'm, I'm not sure how familiar you are with them. I draw your attention to prototyping. Um, yeah, thanks to Elio for uh, reminding me about UXbox yesterday. Yeah, they're work in progress. UX Box and Akira, but there's some bright stars uh, on the horizon. These are both recent applications, very modern and meeting needs. I'd also recommend Presentator, if any of you uh, have used InVision. It's quite similar in the functionality that I need from it. Very nice, very modern. Uh, looks pretty. Nobody will uh, know the difference, at least not the people I've worked with. And yeah, um, a bunch of other apps. We tend to use uh, Matomo for our metrics monitoring. It's open source. It's got a lot of fine-grained control over privacy, which is super helpful. They've got proprietary plugins, which are good for A-B testing and monitoring specific aspects of the user behavior and interaction if your product is web-based. If your product is app-based, then there's a nice open source competitor to Matomo called Countly, which you can deploy as your own server. Uh, they've got venture capital. It's pretty professional product. It's uh, yeah, fully open source and geared entirely to metrics uh, on, on the app front, also iOS. Wasabi is pretty nice for A-B testing, but it's not so well maintained these days. It's heavy. It comes from a big American tax firm, which uh, wanted to A-B test their features. But um, unfortunately, aside from Wasabi, I don't know of any good A-B testing solution that is uh, similarly uh, API-driven.
And sprint management, maybe you're familiar with these. Open project is my favorite. It's got burn down charts, Kanban, and a bunch of other things for the backlog grooming. Ultimately, we want to make better products with open source software. We want to fulfill our user needs better. As you all cheered at the beginning, we're united in that goal. Product management is a critical component to making those open source products better, to making us competitive, to understanding our user needs, and to delivering the value that we need in order to get millions and billions of open source users for the products that we make, rather than hundreds or thousands. And finally, I would leave you with this, to make outcomes, aim for outcomes, rather than making releases. Remember that, it might not be popular amongst your engineers, but it's something that's critical to always keep in mind value over uh, output. And that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Anyone? <laughs> In a Scrum framework, would you say that beyond, uh, besides the PO, there should always also be a product manager, or is it the same? What do you think about these two roles in a in a um, Scrum environment? I don't think there's any uh, universal rule for that. Like the cultures vary from organization to organization. It depends on the skills you've got and the origin of the the team. But uh, they can certainly work very well together, complementarily. In my experience, I've had both a product manager and a product owner in the same team in the past. Um, but uh, obviously, defining roles is important and areas of authority. Um, I actually worked side by side as uh, basically me as a product owner and somebody else as a product owner um, simultaneously uh, in a previous organization. And that worked pretty well for a while. I like that. It's not something people advocate. Uh, also, my um, Scrum certified uh, trainer said that was a bad idea, but for, for me, it's, it, was, it was okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, also in open source, obviously, community management is very close to what we've been talking about because those stakeholders need to be involved and managing their feedback is important and difficult, as I also heard earlier from the audience. So, uh, in Sales Agility, for example, a company which makes uh, sweet CRM, uh, the community manager and the product manager are the same, which seems like a huge amount of responsibility for one person to me, but also, I think it also makes some sense. So, um, it depends on your strengths, too, I think, as an individual and what, what you like. Um, is it the inherent role um, of the uh, product manager to impose some some pain to uh, the actual tech leads or the the, the tech uh, developer crowd uh, to well steer in the right direction uh, that well as you said create a value or is there also a painless way possible or thinkable? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, steering doesn't need to be painful if you're really good. <laughs> But yeah, there, there's a conflict of interest and that's good and, and that's inherent. And I think that's necessary as well because you expect, as a, as a product manager, you expect certain things of your technical team and they expect certain things of you. Um, yeah, with, with the... The, the diagram um, I had earlier with the intersection of traditional roles, uh, I skipped past it, but um, it relates to this quite directly. So we can look at the business role, like so th these are different skills or backgrounds you would you know, typically recruit a product manager from. The business side is like understanding the needs of the user. Um, understanding you know, what the market wants. The tech is about the constraints of what's possible, what's achievable, and then the UX would be how you can package that up in a way that those two things match. So th the constraints necessarily conflict with what the, the demand is, I would say, and so does UX. Um, but that doesn't need, mean that you, you need to be creating pain, but it's also not a bad thing if you do, I would say. <laughs> if they're not too contradictory. Anyone anyone else? Thanks for the talk. Um, I'm not sure that that's a good question, but um, I was wondering in 
in like the really open in the the open source projects we've had, which have open governance, like uh, Apache projects, uh, GNOME, or what you mentioned there. Um, like, how like, have you have you worked in such environments, and how would you position yourself as a product manager there? Because obviously, there, because of the open government model, you can't just enforce your product manager rule there. So the question is, how do you how do you communicate to the project that you should be a product manager? How do you agree with other product managers in the project? And um, yeah, how do you convince the community of your position there? <laughs> I think it's a great question. And I think there's probably people better qualified to answer it than me. Do we have somebody from the Apache Foundation or an Apache project? Yeah? Can you please? Uh, thanks. So I think in, in some ways there will be companies behind successful Apache projects and not just one. Um, you do get some very small ones that are a group of people really keen, but often there'll be a bunch of companies and they'll have direction. And then as a community, the community kind of weighs up that and says, oh, company A is really keen on that feature. No one else is. We're going to let them get a go ahead with it, but it's not going to slow anything down. We're not really going to help. That one over there, there's three companies involved. We all think that's really keen. We've got a load of good feedback. Let's come together and then let them drive that a bit. And so you might say, oh, Next release manager, oh, company B is really keen. Their product owner is being really helpful and they, they've been good. We're kind of going to make them the release manager and let them define done for this release. And if they're great, then we'll rope them in again. And if they're terrible, then we might take it off them or we might just let them do it once. But as a community, you kind of come together and say, between all of us, what do we mostly want and who's actually going to step up and do the work? That's key. You can you can write roadmaps till the cows come home, but if no one's actually going to code against them, then it's it's a bit pointless. So it's it's a little bit cat herding, a little bit people stepping up, a little bit people being permitted to step up, but it also doesn't happen as quick. As a product manager, you can say, by the end of the next scrum, even if you have to work late, we're going to get this feature out. With an open source community, you'd be like probably by the end of the next quarter, as long as no one has too many good Netflix shows, we might get this feature out. <laughs> but you, you can't just like deprioritize fixing that critical security bug that no one else knows about yet for a cycle, right? Things like that. Um, but then if you're building your business on top of it, you might say, you know what? That release isn't out yet, but that feature set is fine, so we're going to take that branch and bake that into our commercial product. But that's you as a company saying, that's done for us, not you as a community, which takes longer. Thanks. And do we have somebody else from the Document Foundation? I'm a, I'm a member um, that would like to speak to this. Document Foundation people? Uh, okay, well, I won't answer on their behalf. Uh, yeah. There's, uh, there's one on the right. <laughs> I always feel bad when I make microphone people walk far. Um, so I get quite a lot of, um, well, a reasonable amount of PMs asking me, after talking about open source design, asking about where they can go to contribute product management uh, in an open source way. So where is the, and I honestly, I'm not quite sure where best to direct them. There's a few projects around, but do you know where best to direct So PMs? you're asking people who have product management experience how yeah. they could contribute? Yeah. That's a brilliant question. Um, short answer is no, I don't. Um, because it's not something you can swoop in on and do without really understanding the roots and the culture in a project, I think. But I'm sure if we think harder, we can come up with a good answer to that. So let's talk. Cool, thanks. <laughs> Okay, well, Sam, thank you for that. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.